Welcome. It's good to see, uh, see you all here. I know that this is the last um, few weeks and you're all um, uh, in a pressure cooker. So um, relax for about an hour and see if you can make any sort of cross links between the projects that are on your screens and the projects you see on these screens. Uh, tonight's a, a special evening for us at the school. It's the uh, Werner Seligman uh, lecture. This is something that we do annually at the school. And as all of you know, most of you know, this lecture is in honor of Werner Seligman, who was a formative dean at Syracuse University at the School of Architecture between 1976 and 1990. Werner's hallmark was really restructuring the school, hiring a young and energetic faculty and beginning new programs to build one of the most valued schools of architecture in the country. We're glad to welcome Jean Seligman, a good friend of the school tonight, and thanking her for continuing to check in on the school from time to time. I'd like to give Jean a round of applause. Could you just raise your hand? I'd also like to recognize uh, Werner's uh, colleagues and friends who are also in the audience tonight. Um, Jerry Wells, I'm glad that you were able to come. Jan, thank you very much. Um, this lecture is a way for us to focus on the profound work in architecture as it's currently produced, and we welcome Craig Dykers in that role. But we also welcome him as the first studio critic in Syracuse Architecture, New York City, a program begun this year to tap into the exception exceptional cultural and built context of New York City. The topic that uh, Craig chose was vertical vacancy. And this project looked at the pre-existing conditions in the towers of lower Manhattan. Now, we usually think about open space in a horizontal or suburban setting, open lots, isolated parcels, or infill. Instead, this vacancy occurs in the midst of apparent density. It's often literally in between the valuable commercial street frontage and the more valuable views of the upper floors of Lower Manhattan. And the students were asked to reprogram this marginal property. They showed compelling studies and variations this past week in a review in New York. And the proposals uh, varied from activating this space to employing strategies like business incubation, settlements for new immigrants, tourism, using farming, slow food, strategies we often associate with smaller cities like Syracuse or post-industrial areas like Red Hook. But as with art, even the way the project was framed, the way the problem was suggested, allows us to look at things that we think we know and understand them in different ways, to separate the fantasy or the myth of a place from the realities of the way they function. The firm of Snowheda presented their work in 2000 at Archilab, which is a, a collection of architects that are brought together in Orléans in France. And the title of this Archilab was Radical Experiments in Global Architecture. And besides the catchy ambiguity of the name Snowheda, which conflated that Scandinavian A, but also somehow evoked snow. Um, but Snowheda, the name, according to the bio, is actually the name of a large mountain standing in the middle of Norway. And as Viking legend has it, it's the resting place for the most valiant of warrior souls, the abode of Valhalla. This is quite a tall order for any architect. Craig instead showed a, a building that was recently completed in Norway. It was an abstract tube hovering above the water, a cultural and educational center about the water and our relationship to the land, cantilevered in the sky. The building was as sublime as their talk was unexpectedly full of irony and a sense of humor. This was a firm that was young and had incredible energies, and the material properties and the presentation of the architecture were striking. 
But really, rethinking and synthesizing material and spatial complexity is what we do as architects, and it's everywhere apparent in the work of Snowheda. The buildings aren't linked stylistically, but by a response to site and program. The building that I cited above, the one in Karmoy in uh, Norway, the fishing museum, or in projects like the new library in Alexandria, which was constructed on a pharaonic time frame, the competition having been won out of a field of 1,400 people in 1988, with construction beginning in 1995 and completion in 2002. The firm was begun at around the time that this competition was held in 1989 and has always conceived of itself as a seam between architecture, landscape architecture, and public art. We see this in projects as diverse as the new National Opera in Oslo, and most recently, the, the National September 11th Memorial Museum Pavilion in New York City. Craig Dykers resides in Oslo, and recently in New York, where the company has established an office in 2005. He was born in Germany to English and American parents and has lived and worked as a member of a global culture. Uh, over dinner, uh, one of the first times we met, I was also delighted to know that he um, speaks Chinese and writes it with some fluency. So it's by no accident that he's wearing a color that he attributes to being in um, Syracuse, though it's more a Harvard crimson. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome tonight Craig Dykers. Thank you. It's Harvard on the outside and Syracuse on the inside. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk for a little bit first before we show uh, some of the work that we've been uh, uh, dealing with recently. I I'd like to at least uh, introduce some topics that are of interest to me. Um, I, it's more of a personal perspective. I can say that if anyone else in the office of Snohetta were here giving a talk, they would most certainly have a very different way of describing the projects. And I think that's one of the beauties of our company and the fact that we have various viewpoints and various perspectives as to who we are. And each person somehow believes that they are more accurate than the next. And there's a kind of pride in not only diversity, but in understanding and self-awareness. So uh, if you were to ask anybody whether the glass was half full or half empty, or if it was twice as big as it needs to be, you'd surely hear all three of those in the audience from our office. And I'm sort of excited about that idea that we can continue to uh, redefine who we are, not only uh, from the outside, but also from the inside. Um, in a sense, uh, there is always a, a, a sort of strong uh, deliberation as to what a conceptual foundation is, uh, and everybody has, again, their own viewpoint. Um, no matter what the question is, you'll find interesting answers from different people on the team. I'm a definite believer that the egg came first. It's certainly less complicated. Our office, as you uh, understand now, is named after a mountain, uh, the mountain Snehepta. It's, it's a well-known mountain in some respects in that, as Mark mentioned, you've heard of Valhalla, and so in that sense you've heard of the mountain, even though you haven't heard of the name. Uh, it's a beautiful mountain, and I think uh, there are many reasons why we have the, the name, and some of them I can tell you over cocktails at the reception later, <laughs> but I can't tell you now. Uh, but one of the reasons that we took the name was certainly there's an in inspiration uh, related to the connection of landscape and architecture here. It's not the highest mountain in Norway. And I'll turn this on now because I see that I forgot to turn the microphone on. Can you hear me better now? Uh, it's not the highest mountain in Norway. Uh, we like to say that we're not so egotistical that we would name ourselves after the highest mountain. But the truth be told, the highest mountain in Norway is called Galgehögpigen, and that would be a <laughs> terrible name. <laughs> we take a trip to the mountain uh, every now and then, usually once a year. Uh, it's unfortunate that the best time to hike to the top of Snohetta is also during hunting season, so it's a little uh, exciting to get there, but it's a great trip. And uh, when we get to the top, it's very much a social occasion. 
whoever can make it uh, to the top and back down uh, experiences a really great uh, feeling of, of, uh, of, of engagement with the landscape in a very real and, and in-depth way. Uh, our first project, which Mark mentioned and that you may have heard of and that many people know of us through, is the uh, Alexandria Library, the Bibliotheca Alexandrina in Egypt. It was a very unusual project, an international competition. It was anonymous. Uh, none of us at the time were over the age of 30, so uh, most of us had been out of uh, university education for less than five years. Uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, there were about uh, 1,400 registrants, and around 500 were judged, and 230 made it into the last round, and then they narrowed it down to about 16. It was from 77 different countries. Uh, when we won this competition and they phoned us, I remember I couldn't quite believe it. I think I was in the shower when I took the phone call, so I went outside and answered the phone and they told me and I put the phone down and went outside and started screaming, yeah, and then realized I was still naked. It was <laughs> a little embarrassing, but it was a tremendous feeling uh, to be the age of 28 and have a $350 million job thrown in your lap. So uh, the fear was uh, somewhat uh, agonizing. Uh, but I have to say that, in a sense, the naivete that we had at the time is probably the only reason this building is built. Anyone more sensible would have walked away as soon as they received the award. It's a, it was a very difficult challenge with a number of uh, uh, difficulties related to working not only in a developing country but in a market uh, which at that time was bordering on recession in the world, somewhat similar to what we're experiencing today. The uh, site of the project, as you can see here, is adjacent to the ancient harbor of Alexandria. This harbor has been in continuous use for 17,000 years. So it was written about in Homer's Iliad. And uh, you will have heard of this city many times, certainly, uh, as the uh, home of Cleopatra. And the home of the, uh, one of the ancient wonders of the world, the lighthouse of Alexandria, which was called the Pharos which sat here. It was a beautiful setting, and there were already some five, 6,000 years of history attributed to this location before we arrived. Uh, the building is rather simple in its context, uh, which is very chaotic in contrast. And I would say that if you can think back, if probably most of you weren't born at that time, but if you were studying architecture in 1989, uh, you will remember that uh, deconstructivism was uh, becoming a powerful component in, uh, in critical thinking. And at that time, it was the sort of ending days of the saga of postmodernism. Uh, so this project came somewhat out of the blue. It was a fairly simple idea compared to the deconstructivist manifesto at the time. It was essentially trying to locate its identity through the largest possible idea rather than the smallest or more microscopic ideology uh, that we sensed was more uh, prominent at the time. So it sits as a sort of disc which raises up from the ground and faces the Mediterranean. Uh, the uh, stone wall which is pulled up from the earth uh, as it faces the Sahara is an uh, amazing uh, piece of artwork and uh, integrated art in architecture. It's some 63,000 square feet of hand-carved granite uh, to give you an idea of the scale, each of these stones is about six, uh, a little, about six and a half feet high, so about as high as a person. It covers uh, alphabets that are inscribed into this wall of some 10,000 year, years of history, about 500 different modes of translation of language. None of the characters say anything. They receive their aesthetic through uh, simply um, their beauty is, 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 is taken through how they appear as um, gestures of human creativity rather than language directly itself. Oops, on button. There's another view. The main facade of the building is actually the roof. So the fifth facade, we call it, uh, faces the Mediterranean. And in contrast to the rather archaic stone that you saw uh, in the last few slides, this is a very, what you could call, high technology facade. As high-tech as it is, it was built entirely by hand in Egypt. So these are honeycomb aluminum panels, which ordinarily are made in factories in, in uh, first world countries. Instead, all the components were brought to Egypt separately and put together there. So the honeycomb was actually made through a sort of hand press, uh, which was really astonishing to see. Everything that you see, almost everything, 
was carried to the site on the shoulders of individuals or by hand. The cranes were rarely used. And the very little electric uh, uh, machinery or, or power tools were used. So it's essentially a completely contemporary building built in the methods of uh, three or 400 years ago. It, as the building rises, it slices through the context of the city and uh, in, in a sense creates a kind of gap into the uh, uh, shoreline of the Mediterranean. Uh, Alexandria is a wonderful city, really. Uh, it's about four and a half million people officially. Uh, that being said, uh, there are about seven million people that actually live there. And when you look into the faces of an Alexandrian, you really sense this history of, of centuries and millennia that have passed through time. You can see Nubian faces, Arabic faces, European faces, Armenian, Asian faces. It's all there, and I really had a fantastic time in this city experiencing it through the eyes of history. Uh, the main room of the library is rather astonishing. It uh, seats about 3,500 people. It's the largest reading room in the world. This picture was taken before construction was finished. They hadn't yet placed the books in the room. But uh, to give you an idea of the scale of this room, it's about three times the volume of the main space in Grand Central Station in New York City. Uh, these columns that you're seeing here are about 60 feet high. Uh, and uh, the room itself, despite its scale and size, feels rather intimate. Because of the modulation of this structural system and the natural light that penetrates uh, through the roof, you're able to really feel that you're in a smaller space. Also, when you enter the room, you enter onto this balcony first. So you're able to see the entire collection all at once. And that's a very important feature in a library, especially one like this that houses up to five million volumes of books. So in, you avoid the kind of problem that you ordinarily have in academic buildings or especially library buildings where when you want to find something, you have to ask for directions and everybody says, well, take that elevator by the toilet to the third floor, walk down the corridor, turn left and say, where the hell am I? And, you're probably at the book you're looking for. So there's a great sense of uh, ability to navigate such a large building, and I think that empowers people in a very serious and, and intimate way. Um, let's see. There's a view from the lowest terrace of the reading room looking up to the, uh, to the top of the building. Uh, there, the categories of books are placed in each terrace. And uh, again, this is all natural lit. And these are solid glass blocks that are about six inches thick. So that when you're sitting in the room, because much of this room is actually underground, but because of these uh, natural light sources above, the light passes through these colored um, sort of veins. And as you're sitting in the room, the colored light slowly moves across the floor of the table and across the walls. So you have a strong sense of time. And, and of course, in the library, that's very important, where you're often focused on your studies and you lose track of time. It's been a rather a success. Uh, the building has about 10,000 visitors a day, uh, and that's been uh, rather constant since about 2002. It's open to men and women equally. Uh, it sets many standards for the region. It's the first building in the Eastern Mediterranean to be fully handicapped accessible. Uh, in 1990, when we started designing this building, the notion of sustainability was not at all common. In fact, rarely did people speak when they were showing a deconstructivist design, did they talk about sustainability. So in this particular project, it can run for um, two months without any power. Uh, there's a natural convection that works in this space using a, a heat chimney that's created by the shape of the room. It's naturally lit and uh, rather astonishing how cool it can actually be on a hot Egyptian day without any ventilation. And that was done, of course, not because we chose to, but understanding the environment at that time in Egypt, the electric grid used to often uh, implode, more or less, and you would, have, you would have to work without electricity for long periods of time. So we all have an office in Oslo. As was mentioned earlier, it's at the tip of, uh, of uh, uh, the peninsula, which feeds out into the Oslo Fjord. And that office has been in practice for about 20 years. So we're a 20-year-old uh, company, surprisingly. Uh, we're occupying an old warehouse on the waterfront. And uh, we often look out through the windows of this space uh, to uh, these amazing sort of ships that float by. It's a fantastic feeling as an architect, really, to watch three or four tons of steel just kind of effortlessly float by. 
it certainly is inspiring. Our main office space is built around a kind of amphitheater. Uh, so everyone comes together in this amphitheater about once every two or three weeks and we talk about what's happening in the office, uh, try to understand what the different projects are all about and uh, really use this sort of democratic platform for understanding the different processes that are at work in a fairly large company. We are actually a little over a hundred people and I, uh, as was mentioned, we are interested in landscape architecture rather directly. So about 15% of our staff are landscape architects and 15% are interior architects. We work together all the time from the very beginning, from a very conceptual level, with all of these disciplines uh, pitching into the project. Sometimes the landscape architects are drawing the buildings. Sometimes the architects are working with the landscape. There's no real definitions of a border between the disciplines. I should say that was a, a picture we all took together in Scotland. We come together once a year, the two offices, New York and Oslo, whenever we can afford it. Uh, this was a lot of fun. We, we chartered some planes to Scotland and I got to wear a kilt and it was fantastic. <laughs> I highly recommend it, especially commando style. It's very good. Uh, we are coming from many different countries. I think actually now we're about 15 different countries. These are some of the people in our office. We're fairly young. So despite the fact that we have a rather large portfolio, most of us are, are rather young. Let's see. That's my partner and I, my dog. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting about our office is that we are actually unionized internally. So all of our staff have created a union. They elect a representative that stands for two years. So all of the salaries are negotiated by the union uh, on behalf of the staff. And in that sense, there's total economic transparency in the company. We've set up a kind of salary ladder based on years of experience. Uh, there are some possibilities to increase that according to your education or what licenses you have. But essentially, it's a, a, a salary ladder. Everybody knows what everybody makes. And furthermore, a principal, which would be myself and my partner, only make about two times, a little over two times more than the entry level architect. So a lot of the money is reinvested into the company and in a sense we create a sort of catalog of ideas about how to run an office from a political viewpoint. We have developed several groups inside the office, little commissions we call them. Uh, we have an ethics committee who uh, talks about the ethics of, what, of the work that we do and where we're going and some of the projects we choose to create. Uh, this is an interesting ongoing discussion, a creativity committee that talks about our modes or methods of understanding how to create projects and conceptualize them. And furthermore, we have a rather liberal system of holidays. So we have uh, the national holidays and we have five weeks of vacation. Uh, so I think total there's around 35, 36 holidays. And I, I say this because I think it's important in architecture to understand what it is that our practices constitute. So often we have political viewpoints that we portray to the rest of the world, but we don't incorporate them into our own practice. And in our case, we're trying to do that in a very deliberate way. Our office has a very sort of unusual setup. Both offices in Oslo and New York are sort of designed in that everyone is situated in one half of the room, very tightly placed together. And the other part of the office is left more or less open with a kind of communal table. So this is our main drawing space. Everyone has the same equipment, the same furniture. There are no private offices. There's no glassed-in spaces. And we all have to move back and forth between projects. The projects are not distributed by studio form. Everyone is sitting almost randomly in the space so that if you have to talk to someone else that's on your team, you have to walk past other people that are working on other projects. So it, 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 it feels very much like a studio. Whereas the main open space uh, allows for the kind of messiness of creativity to occur, a kind of social atmosphere, a communal atmosphere uh, that is hard to develop in such a space as this. And we have a model shop. We work quite a lot with uh, all different types of models, not only uh, technologically empowered model making, but we work a lot with our hands. And we haven't given up the fact that we still have senses in our fingers, which is nice. <laughs> Unusually, all that time had passed. We, we worked with the uh, uh, Alexandria Library for some 12, 13 years. The, the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, the World Trade Center towers were attacked. All of this occurred 
during the period of time that we were working with the Alexandria Library. After the uh, strangeness of the September 11th attacks, uh, we were invited to New York City to participate in the competition for one of the projects at Ground Zero, or the memorial site. And we opened up a new office in New York, which amazingly, uh, and these are almost at the same scale, uh, in a very similar location in both uh, places. Even so far as the fact that this is the old fish market here, and that's the old fish market in, in New York City. So I think we must have an affinity for stinky old fish markets, which of this is the picture of the old fish market in, in New York before it closed. Uh, we started off in a very small way in New York City. It was really working out of our kitchen of the, uh, of the apartment that we were renting as I was traveling back and forth to Oslo about once a week. Our new office, though, which is more, uh, more solid and more stationary, is down in 25 Broadway, the old Cunard building. You might notice this bull, uh, which is uh, just behind is our office space. Uh, mo most of you at least know this bull. If you don't recognize it from that angle, this angle is more common in the newspapers these days. The space is rather incredible. It's uh, uh, built, built in 1925 and virtually empty. So we're sitting in one of these unoccupied spaces that uh, was discussed earlier. Uh, the ceilings of the adjacent halls next to our office are about 60 feet high. They're all hand painted. Really something exceptional and literally sitting empty today. Uh, the space is set up in very much a deliberate uh, style as similar to, to uh, the Oslo office, a sort of common table and a, and a drawing studio pictured around it. We work a lot with our clients we tend to develop our projects in a collaborative nature, uh, and this is meeting uh, together with uh, uh, our project clients in Ohio. I love this picture. This is our local architect, and these are the architects from our office. This is the user of the building, and this guy back here is the budget man, the money <laughs> man. It's one of those. We're very interested in context, and I would say that context is probably one of the more uh, uh, linear themes in our work. Sometimes we call it simply conditions, the conditions within which we work. Context is a kind of loaded term, so perhaps conditions is a more easily modifiable word that allows us to discuss who we are, why we do what we do, uh, in, in, in a way, what is the motivation whether, whether it be involuntary or voluntary, uh, toward creating something, creating anything from a teacup to a building. As human beings, we occupy a rather unusual uh, uh, sort of organism. Uh, our, our lives and our, our, are dominated by the affectations of our form as human beings. Our minds are certainly something that we cannot avoid in terms of uh, what they represent as an aspect of, of ideo ideology. There, there is a, uh, I believe, in, uh, inside of us, centuries of, of development, of evolutionary development. Uh, for many hundreds of thousands of years, we lived as hunters and gatherers. And this kind of living is a very different kind of living than we have today. Today, we are more or less domesticated. So for the past 30, 40, 50,000 years, we have domesticated ourselves, much in the same way as we've domesticated other animals. And inside of our minds, I believe that there is this sort of polar, rather duality discussion about the linkage between our need for intuition and the need for uh, uh, domesticity, for order, the difference between chaos and order. And certainly architecture and the architecture that we create represents this, this uh, duality of thought. I think all of us experience this. I mean, if we have, if our lives are too organized or too well-ordered, uh, we sort of go crazy and have a party or do something uh, sort of that we can't control. If our lives are too chaotic and, and too difficult to understand, we'll grab onto something that we can define and say we know what this is, whether it's family or home or any other source of, of familiarity. And, and our buildings and the way we create buildings moves back and forth between these worlds. And I like to think that somehow we can express that in, in our work. Uh, we've learned to domesticate our architecture as well as we've learned to domesticate the nature or uh, undisciplined uh, surroundings uh, that we face as uh, dwellers on this planet. 
It's interesting when landscape or nature begins to take on its own meaning, we were sort of frightened of it. This is a picture of a, a high-rise building in West Africa. We were doing a project in Guinea, and this uh, was uh, built, uh, unfortunately, by the, a German company who didn't realize they didn't have any electricity in this town. The city is Conakry. If you ever have the chance to go there, it's the capital of Guinea. It's an amazing place. There are 1.6 million people officially living in Conakry, and they have no electricity whatsoever. So it's a bit like going to uh, ancient Rome. Amazing to see how a city uh, survives, and actually it, it works relatively well, incredibly. I think, strangely, we have a discussion about what, how we affect nature and how nature affects us. We tend to believe, especially at this moment in time, that we are so powerful that we control nature, that the global climate is somehow destined to our will. So we look at the climate issues that affect us today as our source of contention. And what amazes me about that is while there may be truths to that discussion, it's, it seems that first we have yet to control human nature. We seem to have more control over nature than we have control over human nature. And this can easily be seen in the headlines of the newspapers that you pick up on any given day. So I like to think somehow that first of all we must approach intellectual sustainability and then we can discuss environmental sustainability. And this will allow for, in a sense, a, fr a fresher understanding of our place in our world. And this sort of question has been intriguing me for many years. I've often uh, asked myself, why is it that we see ourselves as separate from everyone else, not necessarily in a metaphysical way, but a question as to who is the other? Who are we as people? We sort of clad ourselves in uh, a bit like I sometimes feel that we're sort of crabs within a crab shell and a crab shell and a crab shell. We, we, we build these sort of shells all the way down to our underwear to somehow divide us from the, the world around us. It's a, an unusual inclination that humans have, and I've often wondered why this is. I begin looking at people rather directly for many years now. I was uh, very much impressed by Walker Evans and a few other photographers who were documenting uh, people in their daily lives. And this really intrigued me, and I wasn't quite sure why. So for about 15 years, I've been photographing people on my travels around the world, and they're always kind of amazing to me. I look at their faces, and I try to understand who they are and how they exist, what their thoughts might be. One time I read a quote uh, by Vin Vendors about the, the sort of captivating, captivating sensation that one sometimes feels when looking at other people. And I began to realize that when I was in school, I was taught in a way that buildings are real and people are abstractions. That you focus as a, as a student on creating a kind of reality about these, these structures that you're, you're posed to create. And somehow the people that inhabit them are either secondary or simply seen as fuel to create the architecture. I've been trying to reverse that in my mind by through these photographs or other kinds of things, looking at people in a very direct way, reading their thoughts. So to me, in a certain sense, I believe that the people are not the abstractions, the buildings are. And it's a different frame of reference in approaching uh, an architectural solution. I think that inside of us, we're captivated by so many things that we dare or rarely discuss. Our desire to own the things that we create. Our desire to take ownership over the landscape. To necessitate predictability ahead of intuition. To follow our instincts. And of course, what do our instincts mean? One of the most fundamental instincts is surely sex. And we rarely discuss that in terms of architecture. That's a good thing to get really crazy otherwise. But in any sense, there is an aspect to who we are and why we make things that I feel is very much underneath a very thin, almost superficial surface of, of, of a very deeply rooted theoretical approach to architecture. I think it's very difficult 
to approach architecture from a total standpoint of certainty. I believe that doubt is one of the most powerful tools we have. It's not a weakness. And in some way, when we approach a conceptual development, doubt can form it in a, in a very uh, uh, serious and, and coordinated uh, sensibility, I suppose. I think time is another issue which we tend to not fully understand. Uh, this picture is sort of odd to people. Uh, most people, when they see this image, it's sort of disrupting. But to me, it makes perfect sense because time isn't a series of postcard moments. They are not a frozen set of sequences in time. Time is, in a sense, fluid. That's a sort of a poor analogy, but it doesn't have differentiation. The notion of the future and of the past are very directly related. So to me, it makes perfect sense that this plane should be flying over this very strange recreation of a historical event. I like the fact that it's uh, US Airways, which is kind of an odd coincidence. I also think that function is something that we can discuss more directly. Uh, oftentimes, we're told that function is a kind of science, and that aesthetic is a kind of art, or it's fiction. But I believe also that this can be seen in opposition. That in many ways, function can be as much a fiction as aesthetic can be a fact. It's no sense to differentiate these two ideologies. I sometimes question whether we're designing a building or building a design. It seems like a bit of a pun, but certainly, in a way, uh, our approach to what it is that we're making uh, and the, the initial steps that we take to create a real constructed project have a profound effect on the end result. In a sense, this is all talking about a kind of a story, a sort of narrative of thoughts that lead to uh, uh, an ideology of, uh, of, of buildings and, and, and their context. I'm not afraid to talk about narrative, and I think that narrative is perhaps one of the more powerful tools that we have as an architect. I love this expression. It came to me just the other day. This is only a two-week-old one. <laughs> In a sense, all the narratives that we create uh, build up an idea that actually affects our minds. Uh, the stories that we draw on are uh, as deeply rooted as our evolutionary history, millions of years old. I think that, in, in a sense, we as architects need to look at the narrative of our work as much as the graphic potential that they often proclaim. And with that, I think I'm going to just take a very short two-minute break, because that was a long introduction, and I'll show you some projects. So two-minute break, stretch and get some water or something. I'm going to get some water. That's the end of the introduction. <laughs>
Okay, everybody rested? <laughs> we shall complete this uh, talk with some actual projects. So I promise to show you some actual projects. Um, perhaps most of you have seen uh, very many images of our most recently completed building, the National Opera in Oslo, Norway. It was very fortunate for us to uh, receive this commission because unusually it was in our backyard. Most of our projects have been very far away from home. This is the office that I showed you earlier and this is the site for the library. So we can actually see it from the rear window. It was also an international competition, Anonymous, uh, and uh, we were quite excited to have won it. I can say that interestingly, uh, after working with the Alexandria Library for 13 years, uh, there was a little bit of depression hanging over the office. We were completing this rather amazing thing. It was meant to be a, uh, somehow a signpost of future peace and cooperation between the Middle East and the West. And it was scheduled to open on October 11, 2001, which was one month after uh, September 11 occurred. So in effect, it was an anticlimactic opening. It didn't occur on the date that was originally uh, imagined. Uh, there was uh, a very uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of fear for people to fly to Egypt, uh, and so really very few people came. They had to move it, the opening to 2002, uh, the official opening. And we felt like we had been to Mars almost. We had been sort of traveled to another planet, and we would never have the opportunity to work with such a, uh, a, a vital project again in our careers. Uh, so reluctantly, we entered the uh, National Opera Competition, again anonymous, and we, there were some six, uh, well, no, there were 500 registered people that registered, and I think 230 uh, entered, and we won. So it was a, a really a fantastic feeling, again, uh, to, co to come to this kind of point in our careers and realize that we weren't going to be focusing on one building for, uh, for the rest of our lives. The site itself is, is very prominent on the waterfront in, uh, in Oslo, uh, near to the islands uh, of the Oslo Fjord. For about two or three hundred years, this particular site had been an industrial wasteland, and I'll talk more about that in, in a moment. But um, for the most part, it had been a forgotten part of the city, although this is the part of the city that was actually inhabited first by the Vikings a thousand years ago. So uh, this is the, the home of Oslo in, in, in many ways, although that part of the city's history had been more or less erased by the industrial era. Most of the site had been infill uh, that was brought in in the last 100, 150 years. There was an original sort of river mouth uh, of the Akerselva that led down through the city from the mountains beyond into the fjord. And uh, the site somehow straddled both the land and the sea, directly adjacent to the Danish capital that was built about four or 500 years ago in this kind of quartal or quarter district uh, that is now seen as the historical part of the city. In a way, we, we wanted very deliberately to bridge the, the space between land and sea. We weren't going to try to create the notion that it were either all in the water or somehow occupying an artificial landscape of earth. We wanted the building to, to uh, uh, demonstrate the, the actual conditions of this place before we arrived. Uh, in that way, we remove the building from the coastline. You cross a bridge to get to the main plaza. And we've in, in organized the building, you'll see in the plans in a moment, such that many of the functions are actually resting on land. And the, place, the parts of the building that move into the, into the fjord are more public open areas. Uh, the building is rather simply uh, 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 organized. I think you can see uh, the fact that there it's, it's very simply, in a way, striated. It's very difficult to make a plan for an opera simple. If any of you have ever worked on such a, a building type, it is one of the most complex building types. There are 650 people that work here 24 hours a day, a th three um, uh, venues, a 1,300-seat uh, opera ballet, a 400-seat uh, contemporary theater, and a 250-seat experimental theater, plus all kinds of other venues for informal uh, performances that can occur in and around the building. And I like to think that in some way the, the plan is extremely dumb. And to make something that simple with such a complicated program is the real challenge when creating a theater. 
The circulation is very direct. There's a rather impressive corridor that goes north-south. It's about 300 feet long that connects all of the workshops to the stages, and all of the stages are in turn connected to a lobby that um, passes also north-south uh, along the entranceway. The building is extremely low, and in fact, that was one of the reasons that I think we won the competition. It's very common when you're given the, the, the project or, or the commission to create a theater, especially an opera. An architect is inclined towards very dramatic iconography. I think somehow you're expected to pull open the book of, of, of uh, sort of enlightenment and, and create, find the most astonishing thing and then make it. Uh, we were trying to do the opposite. We were trying to push the building down so that it were out of the view, the main views of the city, so that the building itself became a link between the city center and the nearby hills and domestic areas growing towards the east. So the final section, which I rather like these two pictures, you can see uh, it emerging from the fjord, sort of cracking open at the lobby, uh, lifting up this new sculptural form that allows the opera uh, to exist beneath, in this case the opera, and the stage tower just kind of poking through and all of the workshops kind of bleeding out uh, with a totally different iconography towards uh, the river uh, to, uh, at the east of the building. So it's a very powerful kind of idea to allow the, and this is unusual also in operas, allow the back of house administrative areas to be very simple, almost a factory or a machine for work. We didn't pull the sculptural identity over that part of the building. We let it be what it wanted to be. And whenever it was um, somehow needing to push or pull, it did that on its own accord. In contrast to that, the public areas of the building, in some ways, the public demands a sculptural identity. Most people don't actually go to the opera, but they want an opera in their town. It's a part of the city of the imagination, in a sense. Uh, it's something that people like to understand that they have, even if they rarely go there. They also like to think that that part of the opera that they want to look at and to see can give something back to them as a citizen of their community. So putting these two things together, it's as if two different architects were working together. The back of house area is having a rationale which is clear and distinct, and the front of house, the public areas, having this almost intuitive characteristic. In a sense, it talks in a, a very much about the same ideology we were discussing before, about the, the links between intuitive and, and domestic thought. The, the uh, original sketches, these are from the competition, show an extension of the landscape. Although these hills are about a kilometer away, uh, the hills connect to the building and link it directly into the fjord. It introduced the building a natural um, valley geometry that had been there in, uh, in a thousand years ago when the, when the city was first founded. And of course, it being a Norwegian national opera, it somehow had to relate to the identity, whether it be fictitious or not, of the country. And the fact is that Norway is a rather exception, it is exceptionally beautiful country, and the landscape can be very powerful. And much of Norway is covered by mountainous terrain and a rather rugged landscape. So the building, uh, in, in a sense, while not recreating it, Im intimates these sorts of feelings that one has in the landscape in the surroundings uh, uh, outside of the cities. Uh, the uh, fjord occasionally freezes, and when it freezes, actually the ice in the spring during the thaw gets pushed up this ramp, and so you get a sort of new ice sculpture uh, whenever that occurs. Um, the, the ramping of this uh, sort of public face of the building was designed over a very long period of time to somehow move from the top down to the fjord and back again. The stone was actually quarried in Italy and um, factoried in China and then brought back to Norway for um, carving. It's um, Carrera marble. Again, a rather impressive use of stone. There's about 230,000 uh, square feet of, of uh, hand-carved marble on this building, and none of it is thinner than about six inches. So it's a monumental and, and monolithic use of stone, uh, and this will last for, for centuries, really. In fact, this, for example, is one piece of stone. This is not a separate piece that's carved into another. These are all carved out of, um, out of large pieces of, of rock. Uh, the, the idea, in, in a sense, was to create a modeled surface 
uh, and we didn't want any four corners to meet. We tried to create a computer script, which everybody loves to say, oh, scripting can solve everything. And the, the scripting, everyone that we did just blew the machines out of the water. We, we, in the end, we had to draw it by hand. So every stone was drawn by hand, and each stone is unique. As the construction progressed, it seemed to create a lot of excitement in the city of Oslo. And already before construction was finished, there was pressure to get onto the site by magazines and so forth to take photographs and make sort of magazine covers. It was intriguing to, to see what was uh, unfolding in the, in, the, in the city's identity as the project sort of grew uh, out of the water. In fact, what happened was that they were forced to close the construction site down for one day to allow the public to visit the site. They really didn't know what to expect. They put a small advertisement in the local newspapers in Oslo, and 13,000 people showed up. It was astonishing. And they only had five security guards, so the place was just swarming with people. And it was a beautiful day, and, and you, this line really stretched out and down the street across the bridge. You can see, actually, all the unfinished construction work in the crane. And, and people just swarming all over the building. So it was a very interesting opportunity to see how the building would be used prior to its completion. I was out there on that day for several hours and I took a lot of pictures, which I'll show you some of them. The different types of people uh, that, that uh, came that day were rather, rather wide range. Um, interestingly, uh, I would say that what we had hoped to happen did seem to occur and that was that we weren't trying to build a sculptural monument in the, in the style of, of operas and, and public architecture of the past. Instead, we were trying to create what we called a social monument, a place where people didn't take pictures of the building, they took pictures away from the building, that somehow they looking, getting to the building and looking away from it or having an experience on or in it was more powerful than the actual image of the building itself. And you, people really did react very heavily to some of these uh, what we thought would be uh, lesser noticed ideas where the reflection of the, of the uh, sea into the glass makes it feel as though you're walking up a kind of ramp into the sky. As you ramp up from the fjord, you turn around 180 degrees, have a last view of the city, and then you move over to this ramp, and from that ramp, suddenly, the city disappears because the actual roof of the opera is not flat. It's kind of bowed. So you, it's, the bow is such a large dimension that you can't see it, but it, it does um, provide uh, a, a sort of uh, veil to the city beyond. Actually, all you can see of the city are a few little, little tops, and you're looking straight up to the sky. And as you get closer, you see more and more people who are, of course, congregating towards the edge. And as you get to the edge, you can finally see the, the actual handrail. And you look down onto the sort of um, um, plaza below, the opera plaza. People were bringing their dogs, and I always thought this was a good thing. If people are comfortable enough to have their dog on your building, then you know it's reasonably successful. So um, uh, there were a lot of dogs uh, that day, and people coming up with wheelchairs, uh, people with baby carriages, a rather astonishing uh, range of different types of of uh, move, ways to move around the building. Little dramas were unfolding everywhere. This was a little child that was crying and his mother was trying to pacify him. And then you come down the other side. So this is on the other side of the stage tower and you move back into the city, back towards the bottom. And as you move towards the fjord, uh, you begin to become aware of the lobby space that is inside adjacent to the main hall. And you see other, uh, this guy was strange. He walked all the way from Syracuse, I'm certain of that, <laughs> to get to this building. And uh, the feeling of, of, of uh, once again reaching the water and, and turning around, uh, a lot of this has to do with how the body moves. And you can just see it in, in, in the ways in which people are physically reacting to the space. And, and realizing different perspectives and different contexts of nature uh, that sort of connects them to this place. And this was an old couple. I actually followed them all the way to the top, and they walked back down and sat on this pile of unset uh, stone. That dog actually went to the toilet on the building. You know? <laughs> And the young, young, uh, young people came, and I thought I was fascinated by this. People, I don't think these um, young people would have ever found themselves anywhere near an opera, 
but they've come to this one, and I talked to them, and they said, yeah, they might buy a ticket one day. They'll come back. So in a, in, in a way, that was part of the idea, too, just bring people to the building. And if it's a part of culture they might not ordinarily connect to, they have the opportunity uh, once again. And I'll talk a little more about this, but the building does actually um, um, dive into the fjord. And uh, this is before the construction was finished, so you can see there's still the construction equipment lying about. But people were still eager to get down to the water. Uh, we had the opening night, and I remember being very excited and, of course, nervous. Uh, when you're building something like this, it is essentially like making a, a high-performance race car. There's nothing that can prepare you for the reality of it once it's in use. There's no way to really fully test the acoustics to, to your heart's content. Um, and we were happy to find out the next morning I, that it was, it was very well received. And uh, the funniest headline, though, occurred. I was eager to find out what the first headline was, so I grabbed the first newspaper I could. And it said, couple caught having sex on roof, roof of opera. That was the first headline that I found. And I thought, well, it performs. <laughs> they were politely asked to leave, apparently. But, uh, this is the day after the opening, so construction is fully completed. Uh, you can see we've used granite as it goes into the water. And uh, up above is, is the marble that leads you towards the top of the building. The actual um, process is very intriguing. You cross the bridge uh, over the small canal. Uh, you uh, have one last view of the only sort of vertical surface of the building towards the public. And you approach the entrance. And there is this rather astonishing sort of plane that just slices across your perspective. And everyone almost feels as though they're standing on an unsteady surface. But at the same time, it feels very steady by the sheer volume and mass of the stone. It was raining that day, and it rains often, uh, obviously, in Oslo, and still people go there with, with or without umbrellas. There's actually a way to get down. There's a small stair so that when the water rises, you can launch a kayak or any other sort of uh, recreational leisure boats and so forth from the, from the opera. It's also very interesting to be here when it's quiet, on a very cold day when there's just one or two people. It has a, a very interesting feel at the same time. The stage tower is clad in aluminum and has its own presence. As I said, it's part of the back of house that literally penetrates through this marble sculptural surface. It's dimpled to provide strength because it's very thin aluminum for cost reasons. And it's taken after the pattern, which you saw just now, is taken after something called the Jacquard loom, which was one of the first industrialized weaving uh, implements. And these little cards, which have these dots in it, allowed the weaving to occur in a very rational and, and efficient way. And that pr pattern that you see is, in fact, one of the cards of a Jacquard loom that was used to make a traditional Norwegian sweater, which you've probably seen or maybe you think you've seen. Most people think the Norwegian sweaters have reindeer and things on them, but they actually don't. They're much better looking than that. Um, <laughs> so here's the pattern on the surface. And it changes color with the time of day, so it's always having a different kind of appearance. In the evenings, it can be very pink and even very green or blue. People also are attracted to this, and I was quite interested in how many were in fact taking their photographs or wanting to be uh, near to these unusual metal panels. At night, the building becomes a kind of lantern. The only real light, other than the, what's required for safety reasons along the stair, most of the light is ambient light coming from the lobby itself. As you enter the building, you come through a very small sort of threshold in a kind of crevasse through the stone and you enter into the main lobby space, which, as I say, is about 300 feet long, has a connection to the various public theaters. It's divided by a threshold of oak, which is a kind of wall that de delineates where the coastline actually was under the building, and that became the threshold between the lobbies and the theaters. It's funny, this was a sketch we made early on, and you may think it's just goofy, but in fact it's not. It's a very serious drawing. <laughs> um, the, uh, 
one of the things you'll recognize here is that there are no lights or kinds of things up there in the ceiling. That's not because we hadn't finished the drawing or didn't know what the layout was. It was, in fact, because we didn't want anything in the ceiling. And you'll see in the, in the pictures of the lobby that all the lights and all the, the registers and all the, all the things that one normally finds in the ceiling are absolutely pushed to the side and invisible. Uh, the other thing is that we were very strictly trying to create a non-domestic atmosphere so that you knew you were in a place that was not like your home or not like any other place you might see on a day today basis. These columns which are leaning are not leaning because we were having fun. The real reason that they lean is because the pile foundations, remember this is over the water, over salt water, so there's a, a, a foundation grid which has its own rationale that is completely different than the grid of the ceiling structure above. So rather than trying to align them, which we tried for two or three weeks, we just left the two systems where they were and connected the dots in the most efficient line. So this is connecting the roof's truss down to the pile foundation. And the reason it's thicker in the middle is because obviously that's the place where the, a break might occur, where the moment is the highest. Buckling is being controlled there. So here you can see the ceiling. These are just the reflections of the glass up on the ceiling, but there's, there's nothing up there. And I think in a sense, you have the same character that you find in, in, the, uh, in the penguin picture. People look occasionally into the lobby as they're passing down the ramp, and when they look down, people inside are looking at them looking in. So there's a lot of voyeurism involved in, in an opera. A lot of people go to the opera just to be in the lobby. Some are very, have very little interest in the show itself. They're really going to be seen or to see others. We've designed the furniture in the main auditorium and main lobby areas. And I think um, one of the uh, intriguing aspects of the lobby are the toilets. These are the toilets. We had an uh, art international artist competition to design the toilets. And that was a very fun kind of uh, um, approach to recreating what it means to uh, vi uh, embellish a lobby space in a, in a grand theater. Olafur Eliasson won the competition. And this is his uh, scheme for a sort of web that uh, stretches around the, the toilets and it has this light behind it that changes color. It's, the children are really attracted to this. I think they see it as a sort of Easter egg or something. It's got beautiful colors. When you pass through this, uh, this uh, uh, thin, white, very crystalline uh, field, you move into the actual toilets, which are very mysterious, dark spaces and both the men's and the women's toilets are exactly the same. We didn't do sort of one pink and one blue. They're equally powerfully mysterious. Uh, this is the uh, urinals on the left and the, men, the women's toilet on the right. We had this very unusual problem when we were designing the building and that the, the outdoor plaza was sloping down and the floor coming in was flat and at a certain point you, you begin to hit your head and there were, we tried handrails and all sorts of things. And in the end, we created just a kind of slope there. And that was the end of it. We didn't think very much about it. After the building opened, kids discovered this slope. And they really love it because it's polished marble. So they climb to the top and slide down. And everybody's doing that all day long. So it's this very odd sort of slide at the back of the coat room. <laughs> The um, lobby is uh, clad, uh, this wo wooden wall in oak, which is an acoustically, uh, um, um, met it, its method is to control the acoustics in the lobby. It's very important that the individual pieces, these slats of oak, be randomly displaced across the facade. And we tried again to create a scripting pattern. It didn't work. Then we went to the um, builder, uh, the, the contractor, and said, can you just make it random for us? And he said, no, we don't do random. That's your job. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so we went back to the office, and we were trying to make uh, it as, as, as good as we could. And then someone said, interestingly, that they had a child who was in a school for uh, mentally challenged uh, um, students. Uh, and um, we took it to them. And actually, they did it. It was fantastic. The, the school, we gave them all the wood parts and these different panels. And they made the panels in the school. And they were brought to the, to the site and, uh, and put in place. Many of them were. Um, so it came from a different direction than we 
originally imagined. The materials are very primitive. Uh, they, where there's wood, there's wood, and that's it. Where there's glass, there's glass. Uh, this is leading up to the different galleries of the, uh, of the uh, uh, opera room itself. And as you uh, uh, come to the balconies themselves, you have glimpses out to the uh, fjords. This is the, uh, the elevator, which I find one of the young people in the office did this. It reminded me a bit of a science fiction movie or something. The main hall is a very classical horseshoe shape. Um, we were very much inspired by uh, instruments and how they're created as resonance chambers and the solidity of the wood and uh, that creates an instrument so much of the main hall is created literally out of wood only so these are monolithic pieces of wood that have been carved or um, um, routed out in a sense and pieced together so there's no actual steel in the room anywhere that can be seen something happened there so uh, this is the um, balcony front and the only steel that you can find is the uh, um, uh, production lighting rail that goes along the outside. This wood is just um, soaked in ammonia. There's no actual stain on it. It was soaked in ammonia for about a month, and that's what gives it this um, intensity. You can scratch it, and it'll be the same color inside. The uh, top of the room is an amazing chandelier, which weighs about six tons. And it also acts as an acoustic baffle in the space. It's uh, a crystal, um, sort of linear crystal elements with um, low voltage lights behind. Here's a detail of one of the elements sitting uh, seen from the highest gallery. And the stage curtain is really exceptional. Uh, the stage curtain itself of which this is a detail of. Believe it or not, this is absolutely flat. There's nothing three-dimensional about this. It's no thicker than the screen, that this, this projection screen. And, and, and another amazing thing about it is that there's not a single thread of silver color in this tapestry. So all the silver that you see is made by the mixing of other colors. So uh, here's a sort of give you an idea of scale. This is one of the architect's kids playing on the stage with the stage curtain behind. And there's a detail of it. This is probably life size. So this is about life size. And you can see all the different threads in this tapestry coming together and giving the illusion of three dimensionality. It was, it was uh, put to, uh, created by an artist named Pay White in, uh, in uh, California. All of the lights are integrated into the sides. This is the 400-seat theater, the other public theater in the room. A uh, very different kind of character, and I'm going to move through this very quickly. The 250-seat experimental theater, we created the acoustic <coughs> baffling, which is, really can be found everywhere in the building. This is that long passageway that connects the workshops to the stages, and it has natural light. And These are the um, opera and ballet rehearsal rooms at the top of the back-of-house portion of the building facing the river. This is the um, uh, large workshop, which we wanted to be very comfortable for the people that work there. That's the actual constructed space. It's getting only north light into that room. And the uh, uh, quality of the actual workshops for clothing and, and tapestry and wig making and shoe making are all very comfortable. They have a lot of natural light. Those windows are operable. They can get um, air and there are balconies nearby. And uh, of course, the same is true with the um, uh, rehearsal rooms for the ballet which are lifted high up so that they have as the backdrop of their space uh, the city that surrounds them. It's the orchestra rehearsal room, which is below ground, has windows onto the street. And there's a garden in the rear, which is only accessible by the people that work in the building. And this is the cafe, which has a balcony facing the fjord. One of the dressing rooms that looks into the, uh, into the garden, uh, which again, they all have access to fresh air and, and daylight. This garden is really amazing because it's, it's surrounded entirely by dressing rooms. So if you go there and stand in the middle before a show, you get a 360 degree view of everybody changing all their clothes. It's really incredible to see. <laughs> when you do a building this big and complicated, you end up finding some, some very interesting things. One of them is that there were 1,600 different door types. So it was actually cheaper to make a custom door handle than it was to buy them off the shelf because you have to radically change any 
uh, a shelf bought door handle anyway. So we designed uh, all of the door handles in the building and of course they're somewhat reminiscent of the shape and character of the, of the building and the landscape surrounding it. Constructing the building was rather difficult because it's out over water uh, so much of the building is affected by salt water and I should also say and this is perhaps the, the end uh, of this uh, part of the, the presentation that dealing with the landscape doesn't just mean working with it as a geometrical idea or a philosophical one. In, in this particular case there were 60,000 tons of pollutants in the water. This had been an industrial area for over 200 years. So all of the pollutants, heavy metals, uh, bacteria, biological pollutants were here. And we had to contain all of them to bring this part of the fjord back to life. I, my home is right near here. And I used to walk past here every day for about 10 years. And I never saw any birds or, or any fish life or any kind of life whatsoever other than industrial life. Uh, at this part of the waterfront. But after we completed the building, it was amazing. Within three days, already uh, birds, several kinds of birds appeared. And uh, there was uh, even fish you could see when you went to the edge. The swans eat the algae that grow on the granite. And so there, it was really amazing to see how quickly the site transformed to this part of the fjord. And it even attracts people like that, which I don't know what that guy is doing out there. <laughs> The line is rather beautiful, this kind of soft line that's always changing, and then it hits this polished piece of marble. This is the only piece of marble that makes it down into the fjord. So when all of that finished, uh, we, we were suddenly, uh, or getting near to finishing, we found ourselves one day during that process on September 11th, uh, when many New Yorkers were looking up at the sky, and suddenly this, this happened. And it was, of course, an enormous tragedy all of us have a story of where we were or what we were doing on the 11th of September. Uh, many New Yorkers, of course, have tremendous stories of drama and tribulation uh, and how they were affected by that day. I, strangely, was on an airplane on September 11th, 2001, landing at JFK at 9 o'clock in the morning. So my plane never landed at JFK. It made a very large turn, and I remember looking out the window and seeing the World Trade Center towers smoking. And it was the strangest thing. I could not understand why they, were, why they were on fire. And the plane landed in Canada. I was one of those people that went to Canada. And I was with, uh, I guess, some 8,000 other, other passengers in Gander, Newfoundland, in a town which only has about 10,000 people. It was an amazing experience. I really like to say that we experienced on that day the best and the worst of human nature. And I, I, I just remember how friendly people were and how accommodating everybody was. And I, I slipped on a sort of Baptist church pew, which uh, was a little unfortunate because Baptist churches are made to be very acoustic, so the snoring in there was just <laughs> astonishing. But um, I, I, I remember leaving uh, the, the, the church one day and going to the local bar because everybody was, of course, interested in having a drink. They were nervous. And the, the bar was absolutely stuffed with people. And I had my drink like this. And there was an elderly couple in front of me. And, and I said, are you a passenger? And they said, no, we live here. And the bar was not very nice. It was kind of a ratty bar. And I said, do you often come to this bar? And they said, no, we just heard there were 8,000 new people in town. And we wanted to meet some of them. <laughs> it was an amazing feeling. And while all of that was going on, of course, in New York City, it was an enormous drama. Uh, taking place. People were giving up their lives and there was both good and bad sides of people coming out. Uh, they cleaned up the site very quickly in an, an astonishing pace actually. Uh, the cleanup was, was really through within about six to eight months. And in a sense that went so fast that people have now questioned uh, what has happened since. Um, of course the ramifications of that event we still live with today the wars and political sagas that were somehow threaded back to that particular day and the days before that day are, uh, are affecting our lives quite profoundly at the moment. Uh, the the I idea that somehow we could memorialize the site is an interesting question and one that we thought we wouldn't be involved in. We had turned down several offers actually to participate in the rebuilding at Ground Zero thinking that New Yorkers were best uh, to solve this problem themselves. But eventually we were talked into it and somehow we won a competition. It's a strange uh, uh, sort of location for a building. We are actually the smallest building uh, surrounded by giants, really, so to speak. 
Uh, we're right in the middle of, of, of the memorial in, in a particular way, which is unique, which creates a great deal of criticism. Uh, in many ways, the, oh, sorry, the uh, surrounding buildings can almost be what they want to be, and there's very few said about them, but every little movement, every little gesture on this particular site is looked at through a fine tooth comb. So it means that we're talking with great deals of people. Uh, we began talking with families of those who lost loved ones at the site, all the way to firemen and others. It's still a psychologically stressful project. I know when I just look at these pictures, I still sort of uh, am a little shaken up, but, you know, that either the people that own these bikes are dead or, or they didn't somehow collect them. But it was a, 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 as small as it, it, as it seems now in comparison to things like the tsunami and the tremendous natural disasters that have occurred, it really was a tremendously powerful event for many people. And it's easy to forget that over time. But beyond that, there's a, 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 a very interesting location for the project. The only place where they're planning a river to river walk between the Hudson River and the East River that directly connects up through lower Manhattan towards Soho along West Broadway. So there's a very interesting confluence of cultural activities that can occur at this site. Daniel Liebeskin made the first master plan, and this was the location for our building as it was proposed, immediately adjacent to the, uh, well, actually, this is not the first proposal. This is about the third or fourth, but nevertheless, based on the first proposal, immediately adjacent to the um, memorial sort of pools or voids uh, that show the footprints of the, of the um, now vanished towers. We were interested in creating what we call the master section rather than a master plan. The master plan actually seemed to miss much of the identity of the site for us. So in a sense, the memorials which are dug out of, out of the ground symbolize the past. These skyscrapers that are in, incisions into the sky that are productive commercial facilities are about the future. And our building was very much about the present. So we wanted to connect these worlds. There's a, a, a clear delineation in scale between the flatness and horizontality of the memorial that we began to work with. We lifted our building off the ground. These are some of the earliest studies uh, so that we created a, a sort of horizontal threshold that you would pass through as you left from the city into the memorial and likewise as you left the memorial back into the city. But eventually uh, there, there were uh, many interesting ideas that were discussed. Uh, and of course the, the facade was one of the more interesting ideas about this original design. These, are all, these pictures that I'll show are all taken with natural light. So um, we were creating a system where we placed prisms into a substrate. And by the delineation or orientation of the prisms, they would create different characteristics of light as the sun moved throughout the day. This one was placed into wood. And then basically politics got in the way. So that entire episode of the history of our work at the World Trade Center site came to an end. The project was decommissioned. The clients were removed from the site. And we were asked to rethink what our building was about. Eventually, it came to be that the building would create an entranceway for a below-grade museum that's dedicated to the events of September 11th. And our project would be, in a sense, the, still the threshold between the world of the everyday and the world of the memorialized. And so it became a lot smaller, but we think more appropriately scaled in some ways, uh, that it has actually one of the few sort of intimate connections to a building in this area. And most people, when they're looking in large cities like New York, it's hard to really get a sense of where you are. But this building is entirely in the frame of reference of a visitor. So I like to say that it's, it's a rare occasion that you have an intimate connection to a building in New York City. Uh, this is what's below the ground. It's tremendously complicated. This is Calatrava's uh, uh, train station below us in the Memorial Museum also. Um, in, a, in a sense, we wanted to connect what was below the ground and what was above. Uh, through this sort of very large light-filled atrium that houses two of the original steel columns from the Yamasaki uh, building that were rescued. The first sketches of this new design were shown to be very kinetic, very powerful in how the shapes are formed and, and also very delicate in how the building would touch the ground. So this is the existing design uh, it's a, a sort of glass atrium with a metal panel system that covers a significant amount of mechanical ventilation space uh, that's raised up high in the building. Uh, this is the atrium from above. And this is the view towards the main entrance, which are these 
striated, shiny, and matte panels that reflect the sky. I like to think that this building will be both a memory uh, of what happened, but also a place to forget what happened, and somehow you're working through those two worlds. It's one of the few organic shapes at the site, and uh, we hope that it will invite a different kind of experience than um, purely a reflective one. We have done a lot of small projects, and I'm nearly finished. This is the, you might think I've shown you a lot of big things. This is the smallest project we've ever done. It was a fountain for this cat. So <laughs> don't be fooled by who we are in all these very large projects. We actually do about 40 or 50 small gardens and small projects a year. Uh, in this particular case, we were sweating away designing the Alexandria Library, of which there were 36,000 uh, plan and, and section drawings alone without the details. And this lady called us up and she said, um, well, you know, I know you must be very busy, but uh, could you um, do a fountain for my cat? <laughs> so we said, yes, we could do that. If you're brave enough to call us, you've got the job. So uh, we went down and, and it was, of course, a very funny situation. We were all architects who were usually dressed in old black. So we were sort of in our black suits and we met this uh, woman and she introduced us to her cat who was also wearing black. So we were out here. And uh, we went kicking around in the garden, and amazingly, when we pulled up the soil of her garden, we found that there were two, this is in Oslo, so there were about 200 years of history buried in this garden, old bricks and trash and everything that had been covered up over the years, basically junk. And in that junk, we found a piece of stone, we took the stone out, we carved it, and made the fountain out of it. So nothing had to be bought. It was all, the entire garden was built from trash, including the little brick wall that you see here, that was trash that was under the ground and all the stones and steps were reconstituted from trash that we found in the earth. And these kinds of projects are pretty regular in our office. This is a little garden we made from uh, a rainwater ditch that was originally uh, underground in a concrete tube and we raised it up to the earth. And lately you might have seen an architectural record, this project, which is I think published last month. It was very funny because the, you've seen the architectural record, it's got this orange cover and everything is miserable. It's like this end of the world is coming and all the architects are going to die. And this was the only project, I think, one of three or four projects that they put in that, in that feature. So I feel like it's some sort of last vestige of, uh, of architecture and architectural record before uh, we all just look for um, job opportunities. Uh, but in any sense, uh, this project is quite far north and it's, uh, it's dedicated to a minister who was very well known, Peter Doss, a very important minister in Norway. To give you an indication of how far north this project is, uh, it's up north of the Arctic Circle, so north of, of Iceland and somewhere up uh, in the northern parts of, of Greenland in terms of context. New York would be somewhere way over here in terms of uh, southern uh, latitudes. So it's, it's very, very remote. This is a picture of the site where the minister once um, uh, preached. It has a quite beautiful character, and they asked us to put a visitor center there. Um, but rather than placing it out in the landscape, which we thought would diminish the qualities, the historical qualities of this place, we began to look very closely at this ridge, which divided the church from the fjord. And we realized that the building could somehow be incorporated into this ridge. So uh, we began to review that and see that, in fact, the building could be this kind of link between the church and the, and the, and the fjord itself. And, and when this minister was alive, he often used the sea as part of his livelihood to go between towns in Norway, so it made sense. So the building is, in a sense, a, uh, a, an accommodation of the landscape in its setting. It's a beautiful picture, this. So in order to accomplish that, we literally had to take away a portion of the granite that created this ridge. We took the granite, reconstituted it elsewhere and used it for another, other projects and replaced what we took out with a building. And we would leave the surface of the stone that we cut out uh, natural so that we wouldn't finish these surfaces at all after we removed the granite other than cleaning them. This is the section as the building was placed into the ground. Here is the um, uh, sort of earth being removed uh, in the first uh, um, episode of construction on the site. And this is the stone after it was carved out. And you can see the natural conditions of the slope are being exposed. And it was amazing when we finished cutting out the stone, you could see all of the qualities of the, um, of the, the sort of earth being, being seen for the first time. And some of them were really amazing, the way the stone, the rotten stone penetrated down 
from above, deep, deep into the earth. And this was really amazing. When you pulled the granite away, there was a vein which was cutting through the granite, which had this lichen already growing in it. So it was in there that deep into the earth, alive, which I always think of this as occurring close to the surface. But it, it really does have an amazing power, uh, some of these um, biological formations seeping down from, from the soil above. This is the stone that was cut out. It was used in the area to make roads and new, new infrastructure projects, so it wasn't wasted. And there's the project as it's ra being raised. It's a lightweight steel construction lifted off the ground so that you can see through below it. And this is the finished, uh, finished structure. Um, uh, it, the, the main entrance leads you through to an auditorium, and there are cultural facilities above, and it's flanked on either side by the granite. And this is gravel because we found that the stone uh, on the surface could not be left as, as uh, polished as this, so we covered it with granite gravel that was taken from the site. When it rains, uh, the granite is very polished, so it reflects and you, 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 you feel the, 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 the historical church emerging from the new construction. Looking up. And when it snows, it's this amazing sort of thin coat of ice across the roof. Oops, don't know what that is. It's amazing that it's so invisible in this location. It's very hard to see, despite it being very large. So there's a sort of a cruciform effect that occurs from the horizontality of the, of the uh, new building and the verticality of the old. It's not necessarily apparent, but you do feel it a bit when you're there. It leaps out over the side of the rocks and looks out over the, the salt water uh, in, a, in a quite unique way, very similar to some of the older buildings here. There it is there. So this is from the entrance looking back toward the church, and this is the granite wall as it marches along the side of the building looking towards the auditorium up to the cultural center. The auditorium has glass on both sides of it, so it can also be used for lectures, and you get this sort of quality of light coming from in front and behind. It's upstairs in the, uh, whoa, that wasn't supposed to happen. Maybe that's telling me that it's time to end. I'm not sure, I still have another few views to go. That's where it comes down to a point and this is looking off towards the fjord from, from upstairs in the building. Um, well, I can stop. I have another couple of projects. What should I do? Are you, are you, can you manage another five minutes? Or, this, is a, this is a bandstand. Uh, this is a bandstand in a, in a small town in western Norway. Uh, every year, this town, which is very historical, has a parade and a festival, which is very, very traditional. But they sort of go crazy once a year, and they have a jazz festival, and they drop all their traditions, and they have the sort of contemporary evening set of evenings. It's very exciting for everybody that lives there. We, they asked us to create a bandstand for this festival, which is actually very popular. Sonny Rollins had been there. In fact, he named a song after um, um, Silvermine, after his uh, experience there. And the, the shape of the bandstand was created to allow the acoustics to flow towards the audience. But because the, the concert is so uh, popular, it also has uh, um, a group, crowd of people that can't get in, so it has to let acoustics out the back for the people that can't afford tickets. It's entirely stored in three boxes. It can be set up in just a couple of days. And once it's set up, before the uh, festival begins, the cars park all around it. It's partly pneumatic and partly in tension. And it's very, very easy to assemble in many ways. And then the festival begins. And over time, about four or five days, it starts to acquire a new kind of life as the festival grows and things become more exciting and more, more well attended. So by the time uh, it reaches its crescendo, they're lighting the, the thing up in all kinds of ways. And you can see back through the sort of oculus to the sky beyond. And uh, it gives you some really unusual colors. You, you do sense a change in color. It, you know, the sky, this is the same sky, um, but it feels lighter because of the frame of the oculus as you look through it. Yeah. 
I won't talk about that because this is our biggest project we're doing in Saudi Arabia. That's for another lecture. We've got a few projects in the United States. This is a little barbecue pit in Dallas, Texas. So we do still small things in a very low-income area of Dallas. We turned a billboard inside out to make this uh, kind of project. We're making a small theater in Brooklyn. Uh, it's for a, a dance troupe uh, or a, a performance group called SLAM who do these amazing things. They have this old building and they asked us to make transparent building but we said don't use glass because if you use glass it's going to look like this. So this is what we gave them. This is the transparent building they asked for. Um, our first sketch anyway, it lifts up like this on counterweights. So you walk through a sort of entire brick wall. And uh, eventually that changed to be read like this, which is a sort of um, meandering brick wall that was programmed for different uses and it rotates and they can have performances outside on, on these surfaces. And finally, a project here in, uh, nearby, we're working in Kingston in Canada, which is here, uh, not far away from you. We're doing a theater there uh, along the waterfront uh, on Lake Ontario. There's some historical buildings that are there and uh, these are the nature of the site. It's really pretty impressive. Um, but these historically uh, important stone buildings can't be touched, so we have to infill around them and create, with a very low budget, something that's historically uh, active and, and relates to the history of the site. So this is our first sketch models. Um, so you might be able to see one of our projects not far from where you are. It's in design development right now, um, so we're moving it through the process. Uh, today, right on the, that's on the waterfront. These are some views of it. But I have to stop because there's one, there's one more picture, I, I, one more project I want to show you, and then we'll stop. It's this one. This is the last project. We just got asked to redefine the uh, the um, main uh, rotunda space of the Guggenheim, along with about 300 architects, other architects who were asked to do the same thing. So I wanted to show you our entry. We just turned it in yesterday. Contemplating the void was what they asked us to do, which is kind of like looking at your belly button and figuring out what else you can do with it. Um, we, <laughs> we, we began by uh, questioning whether or not the, the, the question was appropriate. So rather than messing with this, which we think works pretty well, we, we recognize that actually um, there are two voids that any visitor must experience when they go to the Guggenheim the void of the interior of the space, but also the void of Central Park and how one uh, experiences that place and, and, and how one is attracted to that place in a very similar way as a spatial commodity within the city as it is the rotunda within the Guggenheim itself. So our proposal was pretty simple. What we did was we flattened out the Guggenheim ramp. We made it into one sort of long ramp and we placed it outside on the sidewalk along Fifth Avenue with the rail facing Central Park. And so you enter onto the ramp uh, where the Guggenheim is today, and we brought with it all the galleries that are associated with it. So if you know the Guggenheim very well, the toilets are kind of stacked. But when you flatten out the ramp, of course, that means the toilets get evenly spaced along the way. And it's seven city blocks. And wherever there was a gallery, we just penetrated into the surrounding buildings, the apartment buildings. So when you're going up this ramp, you can actually see into the windows of the apartments. And in fact, there's a lot of good art in those apartments too, so you're sort of expanding <laughs> the whole Guggenheim collection in and of itself. So uh, some of these go into the Cooper, U uh, Cooper Ewitt, and this is the garden for the Cooper Ewitt, and the slope continues at such a rate that by the time you reach 87th Street here, a car can drive under it, so actually it is practical. This is a little view of it. Uh, so there's the ramp from the Guggenheim uh, leading up onto the sidewalk. There's one of the toilets. These are the galleries penetrating in to the uh, buildings and it keeps on going down the street. This is a detail of one of the galleries actually going in and you're looking in to see the artwork inside uh, somebody's apartment along the way. And uh, I think that's it. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>